Hey guys, all right, today we are back with another Historia Civilis. Again, taking a little break from Julius Caesar because that man just dominates everything. <laughs> this time we're going to another dominating man of history, Alexander the Great, his Balkan campaign, 336 to 335 BCE by Historia Civilis. Um, now, I don't, I'm trying to think of what this Balkan campaign is. Is this when Philip was still king of Macedon? I think I think that might be it. I'm not too sure though. Let's go ahead and learn. Ooh, allergies are still rough. Philip II of Macedon oh, is he dead. Just died. Rip. Rip to Philip. In situations like this, the line of succession was never a sure thing, but for the moment. Philip's son Alexander stood well positioned to take his father's crown. Alexander was the second of three sons. The oldest had cognitive disabilities and did not participate in politics, but huh. many believed that the younger son, an infant, had been Philip's intended heir. Either way, an infant king would mean a decades long regency, and certain ambitious barons were eager to make this a reality. If the king was weak, they knew that they would be the ones running the government. Why? But why would he choose the youngest to inherit? Like, why would he intend for the youngest to be the heir when Alexander had already, by this point, pretty much shown himself to be a competent leader? Now, maybe not a competent leader in terms of governance, as we never really get to see Alexander's skills at governing directly. But we do know his commanding skills, and he's a damn good leader. While everybody was waiting around to see where the chips would fall, one of Philip's most trusted generals, Antipater, acted decisively. He immediately grabbed his army and marched to Alexander's side, publicly announcing that Alexander was Philip's intended heir and the rightful king of Macedon. My dude. With Antipater's endorsement, other prominent generals began to rally to his side. Before too long, a majority of the Macedonian military was openly supporting Alexander. The plot to place an infant on the throne died in the crib, so to speak. <laughs> so did the baby. The next several months were a flurry of activity, and when the dust settled, three things had changed. First. Alexander had taken all of his father's strongest supporters and appointed them as advisors. Second, after getting some guarantees from Alexander, Macedon's largest barons were happily sitting on the sidelines. Third, Philip's infant son and Alexander's potential rival was dead. It's fair to say that he died under suspicious circumstances. Murdered. As king, Alexander's first act was to announce the abolition of all taxes. Going forward, the Macedonian state would rely solely on the income generated from mining and conquest. This made his barons very happy. Okay, that makes him popular, but that's not good economy. <laughs> and may have been one of the conditions of their support. His second act was to publicly pledge that all of Philip's laws and edicts would be upheld. This made the old guard in the military very happy and may have been one we of the conditions of their support. It's always interesting how the crown comes with its own constraints. Now that Macedonian power was consolidated, the new king needed to figure out where he stood with the Greeks. As Philip's heir, the title of Greek hegemon was his by right, but whether or not the Greeks would honor this title remained an open question. Alexander grabbed 3,000 cavalry and rode south. Near Thessaly, the only way through the mountains was to stick to a narrow road. When Alexander and his cavalry attempted to cross the mountains, they discovered that the Thessalians had mobilized their army and were blocking the way. Uh oh. The Thessalians sent a messenger instructing Alexander to wait until they decided whether or not they were going to let him into their territory. This was a slap in the face. Philip had annexed Thessaly during his reign. This was Macedonian territory, and here they were treating Alexander like a foreign king. The pass was too narrow to challenge directly, especially with a smaller army. 
Alexander agreed to wait, but secretly got to work, cutting steps into the rock of a nearby mountain. After a couple of days, Alexander and his men were able to climb the steps on horseback, and before the Thessalians knew what was happening, the Macedonians came galloping up behind them. After some <laughs> quick thinking, the Thessalians changed their tune, and welcomed their new king with open arms. Alexander accepted their submission at face value. As Alexander continued marching south, ambassador- See, that's one of the things about Alexander that we see throughout his short reign, uh, is that if you surrender to him, he's gonna let you live. And he's gonna be, like, now depending on how, like, how at first you were fighting back against him, you know, it depends on how lenient he'll be. But if you submit pretty early on, and you also uh, never rebel against him, you're gonna be treated pretty well. Ambassadors from various lot of Greek city-states showed up to reaffirm his status as Hegemon. This whole time, the cities of Thebes and Athens remained suspiciously silent, but when they heard that Alexander was marching south with an army, they reluctantly acknowledged his status as their de facto ruler. Yep, you're the king, yeah. The Spartans took pride in standing up against Macedonian hegemony. They sent Alexander a message, saying that it is not in our father's practice to follow others, but rather to lead them. As I've mentioned in past videos, the Spartans at this time were only able to mobilize like a thousand citizens, and had resorted to arming their own slaves as a last resort. They were no real threat to Macedon. <laughs> Some have argued that keeping the Spartans as a boogeyman to the south helped Alexander unify the rest of Greece. Sure, the Greeks mistrusted the Macedonians, but they hated the Spartans. <laughs> now that Greece was secure, Alexander made a quick detour to visit the Oracle at Delphi, just as his father once did. But there was a problem. The Oracle didn't operate during the winter, and Alexander was refused entry to the temple. The king flew into a blind rage, and according to one story, stormed into the temple and kinda roughed up the head priestess. He dragged her up onto her sacred stool, and under threat of further violence, commanded her to give him his prophecy. We are told that at some point during this encounter, the priestess referred to Alexander as invincible. Despite the shady circumstances, Alexander took this to be a genuine prophecy. <laughs> some believe that this story was invented to be anti-Alexander propaganda, but if it's true, the king returned to Macedon literally believing that he could not be killed. He was a god, or so he thought. While Alexander was busy consolidating power, the Macedonian hinterlands rose up in open rebellion. Oh. These areas had only recently been conquered by Philip, and with the recent instability, tribes in the north and in the west were now demanding independence. At the moment, the Macedonian frontier sat five days' march south of the Danube. Alexander decided that in order to permanently secure this frontier, he would extend the border north all the way to the river. That winter he gave his army a crash course in mountain warfare, <laughs> and in the springtime they marched off Mountains to meet are bad. the northern yeah, they threat. Do be bad. Somewhere in modern Bulgaria, at a place called Hamas Mons, the Macedonians encountered a Thracian army walking their path. The Thracians were uphill, and had arranged their wagons in a defensive pattern in front of them. Alexander sent his scouts to try and find an alternate route around the enemy, but they failed to do so. Frustrated and unwilling to turn back, Alexander ordered his infantry to advance straight up the mountain, in a loose, staggered formation. But he said he mountain's was suspicious, bad. and guessed that the wagons were arranged that way for a reason. He guessed right. When the Macedonians were halfway up the mountain, the Thracians gave their wagons a push, sending them careening down the slope towards the Macedonian army. Alexander had spent the winter training his men for precisely this situation. On his signal, the Macedonians threw themselves to the ground with their shields over their heads. The wagons sped down the mountain and bounced harmlessly over the prone Macedonians. Huh. Apart from a few cuts and bruises, nobody was even hurt. Give the That's Thracians impressive. some credit. This wagon trick was an incredible idea, and had it been successful, it would have broken the unbreakable Macedonian phalanx. But that's not what happened. 
With their path clear, the Macedonian infantry charged straight up the hill, while the archers covered their advance with arrow fire. The Macedonians made quick work of the Thracians, and took virtually no casualties. Alexander's first military encounter as king was a flawless victory, but the Balkan campaign was not yet over. Flawless success! When Alexander and his army arrived at the Danube, they discovered that a hostile tribe that had been harassing them on their trek north had pulled back onto an island in the middle of the river. They appeared ready to fight if the Macedonians attempted to make a landing. On the northern shore of the Danube, there was a third army, a nomadic tribe from the steppes, cautiously keeping an eye on these new arrivals. Alexander was in a bit of a conundrum. A contested landing would probably end in disaster, but what else could he do? Hmm. He had an idea. Hmm. He had his cavalry fan out and steal fishing boats from nearby villages. He kept the rest of his army busy by building crude rafts out of whatever material they could find. Under the cover of darkness, Alexander loaded a portion of his army onto his makeshift fleet and led them not to the island, but across the river. They landed behind a crop field, which was tall enough to hide their movements. By the time everybody had disembarked, the sun was coming up. The foot companions got into one long line and advanced. Alexander personally took command of the companion cavalry, and when the Macedonians oh, he got close to this them. neutral nomadic army, they charged. Absolute fucking mad lad. <laughs> the nomads outnumbered Alexander's tiny force maybe three to one, but they were totally taken by surprise and retreated away from the river. Once they were back at their camp, they stopped to regroup, only to be surprised for a second time by the Macedonians, who, it turns out, had followed them. The nomads were forced to abandon their camp and disappear into the steppe. Huh. To Alexander, this was a great victory. He spent some time looting and then returned to the Danube. The tribe on the island was shocked to discover the Macedonians occupying both sides of the river. Oh my Rather stars. than subject themselves to a prolonged island siege, they surrendered. Alexander was a genuinely devout man, and insisted that the Macedonians stop, and conduct a series of elaborate ceremonies to thank the gods for their victory. <laughs> Is that supposed to be Zeus? Leading an army I across the Danube was an impressive logistical feat, and over the next several days, other tribes showed up to preemptively surrender. Macedonian territory now stretched all the way to the Danube. Mission accomplished. The northern frontier was secure. But to the west, Macedonian territory was still under threat. The Illyrians had offered their submission to Alexander's father, but were unhappy with where he set the Macedonian border. They decided that this moment of instability was the perfect time to settle that dispute. When Alexander heard that the Illyrians were on the march, he came directly from the Danube. He intercepted the Illyrian forces at a small fort called Pelium. The Illyrians were wise to make their stand here, because the fort was extremely well positioned. It was protected on three sides by steep hills, and on yeah, the fourth a by a small river. This area was only accessible by a narrow path that cut through the hills. Alexander used this path to enter the valley, and settled in for a siege. In case you hadn't guessed, this was a massive tactical blunder. Almost immediately, as if they were waiting for him, another army appeared, lining oh. the hills surrounding the Macedonian position. Oh, that's not good. Alexander had walked straight into an ambush. We done goofed. The Illyrians on the hills done kept their distance for the moment. The path out of the valley created a bottleneck, which meant that entering or exiting the valley with an army was an all-day affair. If the Macedonians decided to flee, the Illyrians would have plenty of time to charge down the hills and catch them in the rear. What we're basically looking at here is a siege within a siege. The Illyrians in the fort were trapped by the Macedonians, who were in turn trapped by the Illyrians on the hills. 
Now, all they had to do was sit back and wait for Alexander to make a mistake. As if the situation wasn't bad enough, the Macedonians had marched straight from their encounter on the Danube, which meant that they were a little light on food. Oh. After some long nights and some long debates, Alexander and his advisors came up with an insane plan. The absurdity on display here should give you an idea of how desperate the Macedonians were. Cause this their own was their insane. great Shut idea. Up. The Macedonians deployed for battle, stretching out their line to make it look like they had more people than they actually did. Then they ran drills. Yep, that was their plan. Drills. In fairness, they put on quite a show. The infantry advanced, then stopped, then turned, then changed formation, all without any signals being given. As they advanced, they swished their sarissas back and forth in perfect unison, which made a whooshing sound that they could hear all the way up on the hills. Then, with no apparent warning, the entire Macedonian army broke their silence by raising their distinctive war cry and clashing their weapons against their shields. La 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 la. Incredibly, this was super effective. The Illyrians on the hills had super never effect. seen discipline like this. It must have seemed supernatural. Some psychological warfare going on. Some groups were so shaken that they decided to pull back for their own safety. This was the moment. As some of the Illyrians pulled back, a signal was given, and the entire Macedonian army charged straight up the hill. Alexander took command of the companion cavalry and led the charge personally. The Illyrians were completely taken by surprise, and after some sporadic fighting, broke into a full retreat. The Macedonians didn't lose a single man. Oh, that's... that's, that's Alexander impressive. Alexander had good reason to be pleased with himself. After walking into a terrible situation, he was able to walk himself out of it without suffering any consequences. Alexander was now in control of the valley, but the Illyrians were still somewhere just over the horizon, and his food problem remained the same as before. He still needed to figure out how to re-establish his supply lines. He left the companion cavalry and the archers up on the hills, while he pulled everyone else back to the river. After some thought, he decided that a river crossing would actually be faster than funneling everybody through the narrow pass. The elite shield bearers crossed first to make sure it was safe. The foot companions followed. All the while, the companion cavalry and the archers maintained their presence up on the hills, which prevented the Illyrians from returning to see what the Macedonians were up to. Once the majority of the army was across the river, the companions and the archers came down off the hills to make their crossing. With the hills abandoned, the Illyrians returned, and immediately realized that there was a river crossing in process. <laughs> they charged down the hills toward the Macedonian rear. By this time, the Macedonian infantry had been able to set up their catapults, which had been intended for the siege, on the opposite side of the river. Oh. As soon as the Illyrians entered the valley, the catapults opened up on them. By the way, some have argued that this was the first time in world history that siege weapons were used as field artillery. Huh. The archers, who were in the process that's, that's, of crossing the river, turned midstream to fire arrows. This barrage was enough to stop the Illyrian army in their tracks, which gave the Macedonians just enough time to complete their crossing. You know the expression, it's better to be lucky than good? Alexander was lucky. Well, I'd say he's good and Alexander lucky. Alexander encamped on the other side of the river, sending out foraging parties Very lucky, and re-establishing really his supply lines. Now that he was able to receive food shipments, he had time on his side. After several days, he sent scouts back to the river to find out what the Illyrian army was up to. <laughs> to party. his surprise, he discovered that they were doing nothing. The entire army was just lazing around, not even bothering to post guards or anything. They were acting like they had just won the war. This would not do. Alexander took his elite shield bearers and some archers and launched a nighttime raid back across the river. As expected, the enemy army was fast asleep, with no guards posted or anything. The shield bearers descended on the Illyrian camp. And before anybody even raised the alarm, the Macedonians were going tent to tent, killing Illyrians where they slept. Jeez. By the time the camp was roused, people were already fleeing en masse. 
a huge portion of the Illyrian army was killed and even more were captured. In effect, the Illyrian army was wiped out in a single blow. The next day, the besieged Illyrians in the fort surrendered. The siege of Pelium was odd. Alexander showed amazing ingenuity getting himself out of a situation that was his fault to begin with. Nevertheless, the victories here at Pelium and at the Danube and at Hamas Mons certainly sent a message. A group of Gauls from the Adriatic coast got together and decided that it would be prudent to establish diplomatic relations with this young king. When Alexander eventually met with this Gallic delegation, he decided to give these foreigners a chance to grovel at his feet. He asked them <laughs> so a nice. leading question. What do you fear most in the world? Instead of groveling, the Gauls answered honestly, saying that they feared that the sky would fall on their heads. Apparently, in Gallic mythology, this was a thing. As a religious man, Alexander couldn't help but be charmed by this strange answer, so he offered the Gauls his friendship and let them depart in peace. Huh. His ego did take a hit though, because he would later complain to his men about how disrespectful and arrogant the Gauls were. <laughs> Bruised ego aside, Alexander had good reason to be pleased with himself. In the chaotic year following his father's death, the new king managed to preserve and even improve upon Philip's conquests. Macedon narrowly avoided a civil war and survived the transfer of power with no significant losses of any kind. The future looked bright. With the home front secure, Alexander began to speak openly about fulfilling his father's dream to travel east and liberate Greek cities living under Persian rule. But if that was the goal, he would need the cooperation of the rest of Greece, and for the moment, their loyalty remained uncertain. That was really well done. And it's just amazing. Just, ah. Uh, the information available on people like Alexander and on Julius Caesar, these sheer, like, <laughs> like, just people in history that are just this good at what they do. <laughs> like, it's just crazy to me how people, like, this is, like, they're extremely intelligent people. They are very good at what they do. And they know it too. So it's just like, it's just amazing that people like that existed uh, where they're so like capable and intelligent and aware of, you know, in case of Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great, battlefield awareness. You know, they were military tacticians, military geniuses, and they were that aware. That's just impressive. But uh, yeah, this was a good video by Historius Civilis. It was Alexander the Great, the Balkan Campaign. 336 to 335 BCE. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.